This is episode 18 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. This is a short one this week, and we'll have a, one of my favorite chapters coming up next week. So uh, enjoy this short chapter and look forward to next week. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 42, 3.1.3, Solutions for Sustainable Generation. Electricity is a tool that must be managed responsibly. Our three main precepts must guide our energy strategy. First, we must recognize that we are one of many species on this planet. When our energy generation affects other species and ecosystems, that use must be critically examined and potentially curbed. The acquisition, transportation, and burning of fossil fuels is deleterious to humans, animals, plants, and everything in the world's ecosystem. We cannot continue to rely on these finite resources, and their use should have been phased out years ago. The potential contamination from a nuclear disaster and current problems of spent nuclear fuel are more than enough evidence to shut down this industry as well. The inability of hydroelectric dams to reconcile their existence with fish and other aquatic ecosystems means they should be dismantled. Second, we should work to mimic successful natural systems and live off the planet's surpluses when we consider which power sources to use and how to use them. The most obvious form of nature mimicry is solar energy. In addition to photovoltaic panels, we can harness solar energy for cooking food and heating water and buildings. Solar energy is best used at its point of generation, and a dispersed grid of rooftop solar is not dissimilar to a forest of aspen in which each seemingly individual tree is linked by a shared root system. Biogas is generated by microorganisms that break down waste organic matter. Instead of letting the methane and other combustible gases escape into the atmosphere, they can be harnessed and used to heat houses, water, and food, as well as power engines. Combustion breaks down complex hydrocarbons to less potent greenhouse gases. Additionally, geothermal power is safe, reliable, and mimics the microorganisms that survive at deep ocean fissures. Finally, although small-scale wind and standalone hydro turbines both depend on renewable resources and are considered low impact, their use should be carefully monitored as no species has yet evolved to harness wind or hydroelectric power. Note, some might argue that nuclear power is akin to the natural system that powers the sun. Unfortunately, we are unaware of any species that has evolved to use this energy directly at its source. Similarly, the combustion of fossil fuels is perfectly natural rapid oxidation. However, no species uses fire as its primary source of energy. End of note. In addition to generating power by mimicking natural systems, we must learn to live within our means, and this requires us to recognize natural limits. No species can survive after it has used up all of its resources. The wolf pack that eats the entire deer herd will soon starve. We must live off the surpluses afforded to us by nature. Our use of solar energy is limited by available area and the creation of light capturing technology. If we applied this logic to fossil fuels, we'd be limited to using almost none. For example, a single gallon of gasoline is a product of almost 100 tons of organic matter that has been formed into oil over millions of years. That's about 40 football fields worth of crops. And at that rate, all of the world's 400 million arable acres of land could only account for 10 million gallons of gasoline annually, which is about 10 days of U.S. consumption. This doesn't even consider the biomass and other time needed to produce the coal and natural gases. Any widespread use of fossil fuels is inherently unbalanced. Third, we should prefer simple solutions to the complex and the complex to the complicated when it comes to how we use energy. The greater the complication of our electric infrastructure, the farther removed we are from the problem. If we had a known and finite amount of electricity to use each day, we would become better stewards of this resource. For instance, most people, when their cell phone battery is dying, will limit their use to the essentials. Our current fossil fuel-driven electrical infrastructure is a dying battery, and we should think carefully about how we use it. If we are forced to strip down our electrical use, we could relearn to survive with a much lighter footprint. It should be considered a crime to dig up millions of years of sequestered carbon in the form of coal to burn it in a power plant, releasing huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, and then to transmit the electricity hundreds of miles only to cool buildings to the point of needing a sweater on hot summer days. We already possess the solutions to this problem. First, we must critically evaluate our own use of electricity and slash it. This would be helped by the adoption of energy-saving behaviors in architecture, such as passive solar water heaters, awnings over south-facing windows, the growth of shade trees, and new construction designed to maximize the winter sun and summer shade. 
Electricity shouldn't be depended upon to perform jobs that can be done with simpler means. Canning and dehydrating food instead of freezing it, hanging clothing on a line instead of using a dryer, solar water heating instead of electric or gas, etc. And when we do use electricity, we should choose the most efficient options. Laptops instead of desktops, LED light bulbs in non-recessed fixtures, room-specific heating and cooling, avoiding phantom loads from unused appliances, and the list goes on. As we reduce our use, we must decentralize our infrastructure and create local energy grids powered by rooftop solar and small-scale wind installations. Not only will this eliminate the inefficiencies inherent in long-distance energy transmission, but it will make us more resilient to natural disasters and blackouts as power can be rerouted between neighborhoods. Our social conventions must shift to celebrate those who live simply and within their means instead of those who waste our common resources. Most of our personal electrical choices fulfill wants masquerading as needs. In the majority of cases, simpler means are available to complete a task. By making hard choices and sacrifice to reduce our use of electricity and to generate it from clean, renewable sources, we will live with a lighter impact on the ecosystem. End of chapter. Chapter 43, The Nuclear Problem, Winter 2015-16 to Hey Stan, what's new? Eric leaned on the freshly built wooden bar. Not much, just busy with the fall brews, you know. Time for pumpkin, said Stan. Nice. Can I get a pint of the Belgian? Oh, and do you have a bit to chat with me? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, what's up? Stan poured the red-brown beer. Uh, can we talk at a table? Eric thumbed toward the tables along the bench next to the wall. Really? Something interesting, eh? Uh, probably. Yeah, uh, let me just close out these tabs. Have a seat. I'll be right over. All right, what's going on? Asked Stan as he swung his leg over a stool across the table from Eric. I have some questions for you, but I need you to keep them between us. And you can't even tell Kat about this yet. Sounds ominous. I'm in. Seriously. Yeah, I'll I'll consider it attorney-client privilege. Don't I need to retain you for that? Well, you need to meet three criteria. One, be my client. Two, I have to be an attorney, which you are. Yes. And three, you're seeking legal advice. Uh, okay, sure. I can do that. What are the legal ramifications of shutting down every nuclear power plant by threat? Stan sip a beer caught in his throat. (laughs) Well, you should know of the three exceptions to attorney-client privilege. First, someone overhears us. Second, you waive this privilege. And third, you are planning a crime and are seeking information to circumvent the law. Eric laughed. Okay, all right. This is then a hypothetical discussion. Sure, okay, that's fine. Kat told me you used to be interested in shutting down nuclear power plants, so I thought I'd run a, he raised his hands to make air quotation marks, hypothetical scenario by you. If the national power grid collapsed, what would happen to nuclear plants? What did Kat tell you exactly? Just that you were looking at ways to shut down these plants when you met. Did she bring it up? No, I was asking her about secure online communications. Why? You know, just gathering information on my hypothetical scenario. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, well, let's just leave that lie for a moment. When the power dies at a plant, an automatic process known as a SCRAM takes place. Supposedly, SCRAM is an acronym for Safety Control Rod Axeman. And the story goes that at the first nuclear reactor, which was built under the bleachers at the University of Chicago in early 1940s, right, they had a man standing with an axe near a rope that suspended a rack of control rods over the reactor. If the reaction started to run out of control... They'd cut the rope, and the control rods would absorb the excess neutrons and kill the reaction. Modern reactors have not changed much, except they have replaced the axe man with a gravity and spring-driven rack of control rods. Within a few seconds of a scram order, the rods are fully inserted into the core. Although this immediately stops most of the reaction in the principal fuel, a little of the daughter material will still continue to produce quite a lot of heat for hours after the scram, and enough heat to cause problems for months. If they're shutting it down for a prolonged period... They'll add liquids like boric acid to the water surrounding the core. It's called nuclear poison, or more technically, liquid neutron absorbers, or LNA for short. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. So if the power across the country was cut permanently, in a few weeks, the nuclear power plants could be considered stable? Oh, hell no. We're talking hundreds of hours of cooling needed to get these cores to cool down. Without power, the plants run on backup batteries or diesel generators to keep their coolant flowing. And let me guess, they won't last hundreds of hours, right? They won't last 10 hours. A dozen or so plants have about 8 hours of battery life. The rest only have 4 hours. Most plants depend on the generators. They are required by law to have at least 2 generators, either of which is capable of powering the emergency system. It's supposed to be redundant for safety. Each generator has a weak supply of diesel. So, in an ideal world, each plant has 2 weeks worth of fuel. And the core can be cooled down in 2 weeks? 
<laughs> well, that's a relative term, isn't it? Nuclear plant safety protocols are predicated on the reestablishment of the power grid. To my knowledge, the feds have no plan for long-term power outage. Note, this is according to Scott Burnell, public affairs officer at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who entertained my questions in October of 2016. End of note. Eric was silent for a little while. What happens when the batteries and generators fail? Uh, Fukushima Daiichi? Chernobyl? But you know, at 61 plants across the U.S. simultaneously? Even a small percentage of the operating temperature is enough to boil off any coolant that isn't circulated by pumps. Fukushima would have been fine if it wasn't for the tsunami. They scrammed the reactors due to the earthquake. Didn't they have high storm walls? Sure, they were about 5 meters high. Wasn't it built on high ground? Yeah, it was 10 meters above sea level. How high was the wave? 14 meters. It flooded out the generators located in the basement, which led to a partial meltdown. We'll have to think this out carefully. Uh, I mean, hypothetically, of course. Yeah, right, of course. How then would you get the plants down safely? Stan paused, thinking. Hmm. It would take years for the fuel to cool enough to sit benignly in a pool of uncirculating coolant, so that's out. The danger comes from a breach in the containers. A power station is built like those Russian nesting dolls. A meltdown itself isn't bad unless it causes a steam explosion or fire that rips open the reactor vessel, primary containment structure, and secondary containment structure. If you could get the core cool enough that a meltdown could be contained, preferably in the reactor vessel, it might be your best bet. Instead of a contaminated landscape, you'd be dealing with only the interior of a building. How long would it take to get the core that cool? A year would be safest, but six months might be enough. That means running the generators for six months? Having a crew monitoring the station for six months? The generators, yes, but some responsible adult would have to babysit the thing for a, really the foreseeable future, even after a contained meltdown. Eric was silent. It floors me that we built these systems. The safety features are all predicated on the support systems functioning smoothly. If you stop managing a coal plant, it shuts down. If you stop managing a nuclear plant, it's likely to explode and spread contaminants over the surrounding region. The collapse of the electrical grid was and is seen as such a remote possibility that realistic measures are not in place. All right, so how much fuel would the generators need? It's tough to give a straightforward answer to that because the variables involved. First, we have 61 plants, but 99 reactors. Plants with two or three reactors need more power to run their generators than single reactor facilities. Second, somewhere between an eighth and a sixth of reactors will be down each spring for refueling. That's when the power demand is the lowest, between winter heating and summer cooling. This would be the best time for the disaster to strike because those reactors would be cooler from the get-go. Third, plants have differently sized generators. I've got the exact numbers written down somewhere, but the average is 3 megawatts per hour. The lower end is around 2, and some have generators putting out over 6 megawatts per hour. The efficiency of these generators is roughly linear, needing about 200 liters of diesel to generate cooling for a megawatt in an hour. So let me see, he said, grabbing a napkin and a pen. 3 megawatts, 24 hours, 180 days... 99 reactors is carrying about mm, 1.28 billion kilowatts, which then needs um, 257 million liters of diesel over six months. Or, said Eric, who had been calculating on a smartphone, an average plant would need about 14,400 liters per day. That's about half the capacity of a tanker truck, so every two days a tanker truck would need to refuel these plants for six months at a minimum. That doesn't sound feasible. Not if the grid is down. What else is going on during that time? Well, hypothetically, uh, the natural gas and petroleum pipelines would be disabled. That would only leave the National Strategic Reserves. Reserves plural? I thought we just had the one petroleum reserve down in Louisiana somewhere. We also have a diesel reserve up in the northeast. It's for heating oil, but that has about a million barrels stored up in the beginning of each fall. That works out to, let's see, 159 liters per barrel divided by a national daily need. Mm, about 100 days of fuel, but that assumes it's all allocated for nuclear emergency regenerators. Yeah, I imagine the New Englanders will be riding in the snow without heating oil that winter. Better that than a nuclear winter. We're still 80 days short of a half a year. What about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Oh, that's plenty big enough. More than a billion barrels of diesel could be made. Problem solved, then. No, it, it's stored as crude and would have to be refined, which might be difficult without pipelines or electricity, don't you think? Shit, said Eric. Shit indeed, said Stan. End of chapter. End of episode 18 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. And thanks for listening.